Hello, so my name is Jonathan Eggard. This is my contribution to the uh, Philosophy in and on Translation Symposium. I'm going to get my presentation up now, uh, which will have the question uh, I'm attempting to answer. Uh, okay, great. So the question uh, that I'm attempting to answer today is can a philosophical tradition arise out of translation? Now, I'm gonna to attempt to answer this question uh, actually by answering another one, one that I think has the same answer and that's gonna allow us uh, to, to explore the two, uh, the two together. Now, the question, uh, the second question is, how does philosophy learn to speak a new language? That is, how does uh, a given natural language come to serve as the vehicle for a philosophical conceptual vocabulary and how does this philosophical conceptual vocabulary uh, serve to enrich uh, philosophy across languages more generally. Now I'm going to examine this by means of a case study which is how philosophy came to speak Gers, an Ethiosemitic language from the Horn of Africa. Uh, my answer is going to be, and this is the sense in which I think it will answer our first question too, that it does so by translation. Philosophy learns to speak Gers by translating Greek and Arabic philosophy into it, transforming these new ideas into a new conceptual idiom. The further contention that I'm gonna go on and argue in the last part of the paper is that this is in fact a very common way that philosophy comes to speak a new language, that if we're to understand philosophical traditions linguistically, this is how almost all philosophical traditions arise. Now, the plan uh, of how I'm gonna go about answering this is to start by saying a few words about how philosophy learns to speak, uh, what I mean by this question. I'm gonna then say a little bit about uh, the Gers language and literature. Um, go on to say a little bit specifically about the philosophy which is composed in Gers, um, its best known manifestation in the Hatat Azeri Yaakob, um, the notion that the tradition may have been uh, founded in philosophical translation, uh, and then a little bit about what I understand philosophical vocabularies to be, as they're going to be the pivot for um, the next part of the argument I try and make, which is a comparison of how philosophical vocabularies emerge via the process of philosophical translation in Ethiopia and in 16th century England. Uh, and after having done so, um, I'm going to close to some, uh, a series of conclusions and, and remarks about the significance of linguistic diversity for philosophy in the present. So to start with Gers uh, and the language, Gers, as I've mentioned, is an Ethiosemitic language. Um, that means it's closely related to the languages of modern Ethiopia. Uh, it's lingua franca, Amharic, as well as Tigrinya, Harari, Guraji, and others as well as more distantly to Hebrew and Arabic. Um, now, unlike Hebrew and Arabic languages whose philosophical uh, history and traditions are well known, um, Gers is uh, an Abu Gida rather than an Abjad. So whereas Hebrew and Arabic uh, will have diacritic marks expressing their um, vowel endings, in Gers we have individual pictograms for each of the vowel endings, something which leads to uh, I think a very economical and beautiful method of writing, but one which can be slightly off-putting for people trying to learn it because there will be 182 pictograms you have to learn before you can read it. Um, Gers was spoken in the Aksumite Empire. Uh, the relation between uh, the uh, modern Ethiopian languages, Ethiosemitic languages and uh, Gers is often uh, likened to the relationship between uh, Latin and the modern Romance languages in that it's the language of the ancient empire. It's now a, a dead language um, since, since the ninth century at least. But, um, and to an extent probably more than Latin here, if you've ever been to an Ethiopian Orthodox church, you will know that it is certainly not dead in that context. Um, it's the language of chants, sermons, and readings from religious books in every, any Ethiopian or Eritrean Orthodox church. Uh, and interestingly, also in uh, for the Beta Israel community, the community of so-called Ethiopian Jews, um, who uniquely amongst Jewish communities in the world use Gers 
uh, rather than Hebrew, uh, that don't have Hebrew as the language of their religious ceremonies. Um, Gurs literature, properly speaking, begins with the first inscriptions in writing in Gurs in the fourth century AD. Uh, that includes texts uh, like that of the Azana stone, uh, the Rosetta stone of Ethiopia, as it's sometimes been called, which has, as we can see on the broad, darker side here, uh, Greek text, uh, Gurs characters here, and then Sabaean, an ancient, uh, ancient South Arabian language on the other side. And it's through this, this close contact with um, South Arabia and with the Greek world, that Ethiopia becomes one of the first countries in the world to adopt Christianity as its official religion. Um, its early adoption of Christianity um, is one of the reasons, I think, why uh, Ethiopian girls literature in its early and to a significant degree in later centuries is dominated by um, religious writings. Um, this includes translations of the Bible. Um, on the right here, we've got an example of a page from the earliest ever uh, illuminated, surviving illuminated manuscript um, of the Bible, uh, the Gadima Gospels from the fifth century. But there are many original uh, religious compositions, um, lives of saints, uh, the Zema, which are hymns or chants, uh, the Endemta tradition of biblical hermeneutics and criticism. Um, but Gers literature also includes uh, historical chronicles, medical and scientific writings, um, and the enigmatic magic scrolls uh, that, that often come up. Um, and for our purposes, I suppose, most importantly, also of philosophy. Now, um, if you've heard of a text of philosophy written in Gers before, it will almost certainly be the Hatata Zari Yaakob. The Hatata Zari Yaakob um, is sometimes said to be the oldest written work of philosophy, indeed also the oldest autobiography in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's been said uh, to anticipate ideals, the highest ideals of the European Enlightenment in uh, its belief in the equality of all human beings, on the significance of a universal capacity of reason for improving human society, uh, and human moral life. Um, and historically speaking, perhaps most remarkably, for seeming to show that modern philosophy understood as a critical, individual, uh, rationalistic exercise begins in Ethiopia at the same time as Europe, the text having been composed um, almost exactly contemporaneously with Descartes' writing of Discord de la Methode. Um, now, the text has been surrounded for the last century in an authorship controversy that we won't go into now. Um, suffice to say that many of the greatest Ethiopian scholars seem to think that it was not written by a 17th century Tigrayan monk, but by a 19th century Italian missionary in Ethiopia. But for our purposes, it's only really important to see that this is an original composition in Gers um, in a later sort of Amharicized style, which has lots of influence from the vernacular, rather than a product of translation, uh, strictly speaking. Um, and the, the sort of dominance of uh, the Hatta Tazari Yaakob in discussions of Gers philosophy have often meant that earlier possibilities uh, of an origin of Gers philosophy have been neglected. Um, I'm going to actually skip over these ones now so that we have time to really go into the translation. Um, one of the most interesting uh, suggestions here, given by Claude Sumner in uh, the first volume of his five volume work on Ethiopian philosophy, really the, 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 the thing to read on philosophy in Gers and other languages of Ethiopia. He claims that the earliest works of philosophy in Gers are in fact two translations from the Greek, translations of the Physalogos and the Book of Wise Philosophers, which he argues acquire an Ethiopian character. Uh, through the act of translation. Now, the Fisologos we might not call uh, a work of philosophy uh, in contemporary academic philosophy departments. It's a kind of work of nature mysticism popular in the Christian East, translated from uh, Greek, probably via Christian Arabic sources in uh, Egyptian monasteries. Uh, and on the, uh, the, the other text, maybe more recognizably philosophical, uh, it's a compendium of maxims uh, read, um, attributed to figures like Abrakt, Sikrat, Afliton, and Agalen, which are the girls' names for Hippocrates, Socrates, 
Plato and Galen, as well as two biblical figures like David and Solomon and the Ethiopian saint Yared. Now, Sumner argues that the text, that the Ethiopian translations are not simply faithful transmissions of foreign texts into an Ethiopian language. He sees translation here as being a medium of philosophizing itself, a site for conceptual innovation. He emphasizes in this the creativity of translation. Uh, and I think we can distinguish two ways uh, that, this, that this happens. There's maybe a more modest way in which um, the inclusion of Ethiopian uh, people, Ethiopian saints like Yared, Ethiopian places uh, and animals. There's a discussion of Plato talking with a lion, which probably couldn't have existed in the, in the Greek original, um, make the text Ethiopian in much the same way as some of the adaptations of um, uh, biblical stories in the Ethiopian national epic, the Kebrenagast, in which the, um, the Ark of the Covenant comes with the son of Solomon and Sheba to, to reside in, in Ethiopia. But these, these, I think, whilst are fascinating for all sorts of different reasons, are not the most philosophically interesting case here. Now, the philosophically interesting thing, I think, is looking at how concepts travel across these linguistic borders from Greek into Gers. And we can distinguish, again, two different ways in which this happens. In one of them, a language acquires a word. The classic example of this, not only in Gers, but in almost every philosophical, in almost every language, is the term philosophy itself. Almost no term, no language coins a new term for philosophy. They try and either translate its constituent parts or to change it by some sort of pronunciation or transcription. So the same in Gers, it has falsafa, much as Arabic uh, does for philosophy. On the other hand, we can turn existing words in a vocabulary to, in a language to philosophical use. Um, I'll give an example of how this works here. So we have the term alam, um, or alam which is uh, it's, it's the closing lines of, of the Lord's Prayer in Gers, la alam alam, uh, forever and ever, all, all eternity, which in philosophical works um, can be extended and stretched so as to mean something more metaphysical along the lines of a totality, uh, eternity, uh, things like that. Um, another case might be, and this is one that's given a lot of troubles to interpreters of Zeri Jacob's philosophy, is when we turn to uh, the, the term, when people try and interpret Zeri Jacob as being a rationalist or as a... Um, precursor of the Enlightenment, they often try and um, translate term, the term that Zeliak has of Leb as mind or intellect or reason. And one of the difficulties with this is that strictly speaking, Leb means uh, not something like the brain or the mind or, or a faculty like that, but it's literally speaking the noun for the human heart. So a comparative study of uh, rationalism in, uh, in Ethiopia and in, in Europe in the, in the 17th century would have to take, uh, take account of the fact that the term, which is at the basis of a rationalism in the Ethiopian case, is grounded in a very different semantic field, very different set of connotations um, to, uh, to, to the European case. Um, and finally, just a definition that when I talk about the philosophical vocabulary, I just mean the set of philosophical terms, either which are imported from another language or of these existing terms, which are turned to philosophical uh, use, extended beyond their ordinary use for philosophical purposes. Um, and I don't think at all that this is unique to philosophy in Gers. I think that we can see similar um, dynamics at work when in the early Roman Republic, Cicero and others uh, begin to translate Greek works into Latin um, with the translation of uh, Greek philosophy um, into Hebrew, Syriac, Armenian um, in, in, the late, in late antiquity, um, and probably most famously in the case of the great translation movements of, of early Islam from Greek into Arabic. Um, scholars have also argued that we see something similar in <clears throat> uh, cases of uh, Arabic philosophy translated or written in uh, the Ajami scripts uh, of West Africa in the libraries of Timbuktu. And as I'm going to go on to argue now, 
that we see in uh, the emergence of philosophy and the vernacular languages of Europe from Latin. So in, in his wonderful history of uh, English language philosophy, Jonathan Ray begins in the 16th century with the development of a philosophical vocabulary of a way of doing philosophy in the English language after the thousand year dominance of Latin in Western Europe. And he argues that these vocabularies develop primarily through philosophical translation, but also through debates over the methodology and aims of philosophical translation. The question as it was posed by a contemporary uh, contributor to these debates was whether they should use terms of some other tongue and by a little change of pronouncing to seek to make them English worded, that is to import uh, terms like philosophy, as, as was done in Gers, or to coin understandable terms of true and ancient English words, or to use the terms we already have, uh, or to coin new English ones. Now, John Florio, the earliest translator into English of Montaigne, said that he could not philosophate and fantasticize in English without borrowing uncouth words from French and Latin. On the other side, Ralph Lever accused Latinates like Florio of making a mingle mangle of their native speech with their inkhorn terms. Now, history has told us who won out. Ralph Lever suggested, for example, ye say and nay say for affirmation and negation. I've never heard anyone say that, whereas terms which were imported from French or Greek or Latin, terms like person, emotion, ethics, politics, nature, are indispensable parts, not only of our philosophical vocabulary, but of our everyday speech. Um, philosophical translation enriched the English language beyond all possible recognition. And I think that the lesson to take from this is that where we see the symbiotic relationship between philosophical translation and the English language, in which philosophical translation, first of all, enriches the English language and then allows English language philosophers to give so much back to um, philosophy uh, more broadly, we see that the same occurs in Gers. Philosophical translation into Gers allows Gers speakers and writers to express new ideas. But at the same time, the adapting of terms in Gers gives philosophical ideas, reason, eternity, whatever else, a new and nuanced understanding. We think about reason very differently when we think about the possibility of the seat of reason as being the human heart. And I think this is true for any language that enters into philosophy. Um, and that we could really say that this, this giving back, this kind of symbiosis is part of the importance, a large part of the importance of linguistic diversity in philosophy. Um, it would also show us, I think, historically speaking, that one of the fundamental significances of, of philosophical translation is that if, if languages enter into philosophy in this way, they always do so in dialogue. They don't do so in the kind of ontological nationalism suggested by Heidegger, um, you know, where <clears throat> simply, you know, there are these terms which bind on to, to nature in some way and that any, any language which does so by processes of mixing and stuff is in some way diluted. Text, you know, philosoph philosophy occurs as a cosmopolitan idea by virtue of more of these languages entering into it, um, the friction between them, allowing for the development of new concepts, ever broader and wider um, conceptual vocabularies. But it's, it's not just a historical point, really in a time where philosophy is increasingly monolingual, when it's consolidated in an increasingly small number of languages, the importance of conducting new philosophical translations into languages which may not have traditionally been part of this, is a vital way of allowing us to expand the conceptual vocabularies that we use of seeing the myopias and the narrownesses of the ones that we, we do sometimes employ, of thinking about how the concepts that we seem to, uh, that seem necessary to, to use and to live by could be otherwise. So I'll conclude with, with that point uh, and say, say many thanks uh, for your attention. Um, I look forward to uh,